chapter 11, verse 34 through 38. Your eye is like the lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when it is unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. Make sure the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant, as though a floodlight were filling you with light. Jesus criticizes the religious leaders. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Praise the Lord. A little bit disjointed this morning, so that's on me. But God is good. Can I hear you say amen? Amen. Amen. So we're going to continue this morning on a teaching on the power to change. And so last week we spoke on on the power to change. It's based loosely on a Bible, on a study by a pastor called uh, Craig Crochelle. And so why, why would you speak on the power to change? And how is the power of change relevant to each and every one of us? And the truth is this, that one day you and I will close our eyes and we're going to stand before the Lord. And that's the home truth. And I'm, I'm not a mathematical sort of person, but I am a little bit. And when you compare your life on this earth as 60, 70, 80 years to eternity... And we understand that eternity is in the making. Our capacity to live in such a way that is pleasing to God, to not only be accepted by him, but to live in such a way as honours him, becomes kind of really important. And one of the things that we as Christians are called to do, you and I are called to do, each and every one of us, is to reflect the image of God so that what we talk about, we walk about so that the rubber hits the road. And it's always a very difficult discussion for Christians because we know that by grace you're you're saved, which means nothing you can do can earn you merit with God. And so it's only by grace that you're saved. And we saw last week, not only by grace you're saved, but it's by grace that we keep getting saved. Remember last week we said that we don't need behaviour modification you and I need a spiritual transformation. But the other part of being a Christian is that our lives need to reflect the image of God. And to do that means that we have to change. There's bits of our lives that have to change. Sometimes we have attitudes, sometimes we do actions, and and we do them almost automatically. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And because um, the question is this, why do we do what we do in given situations. Because most of us are creatures of habit. I'll give you a few examples. The alarm rings in the morning. Husbands, you can look at wives. Wives, you can look at husbands. The alarm rings in the morning. Number one, some people, the alarm will ring, and all that is is a reflex action for them to hit the snooze button. You know, and they snooze button, you know, another five minutes, they hit it again and again and again. Don't put up your hand. Other people, your goal in life is to get up before the alarm. The alarm doesn't even go off. You're up every single day. Why do you guys do that? Some people, you go to a restaurant, right? You might go to a restaurant, you might go out. You might go out and you look at the menu and the menu, there's all sorts of healthy choices that you can look at and, you know, you should be, you know, you're trying to lose a little bit of weight or keep healthy and there's all this stuff called vegetarian food. I don't know if you ever heard about it. And and like all this sort of, I don't know, clean sort of food. Or then there's other type of food and the attitude and some people will just eat you know oh no I'm trying to be healthy I'll do this or no no I'm going out I want to treat myself you know what is it I'm going to get the biggest steak or I'm going to I'm I'm here to enjoy myself so it doesn't matter I'm going to do that sometimes with finances sometimes with finances you just seem to have money you just some people just seem to have money they're able to you know uh, look after their family they're able to honor god they're able to the decisions they make it's it's they put god first in what they do they're able to honor god they're able to do all these sorts of things but other times it just seems that 
it just seems to struggle all the time. I earn this much, but I'm, I'm always short. The credit card is always building. Why do we do what, do what we do? Why is it that we make those sorts of decisions? Sometimes there might be a, an argument in the office or an argument at home or argument, whatever, and there'll be two sides. There'll be, you know, one side and there'll be another side. Sometimes there are people that will always, always back up the underdog, whoever that is, doesn't matter, it's always that person's fault or, you know, whoever it is, now I'm going to stick up for the underdog. Everyone's going to do it. You almost pride in sort of sticking up for the underdog in a situation. Why do we do, what are the thought processes that uh, make us do that? Why do we do what we do? And there, there was a bit of a study, and in this, in this particular study that, um, that was done, they said that there are two reasons why we do what we do. There's a primary reason that we will look at a little bit later, but there are secondary reasons. And it's a little bit like this. When I was at work, you know, we, we were in a plant and there was a lot of people, and sometimes people would have accidents, right? And when there was an accident, obviously you'd look after them, make sure they're healthy and fine and all the rest of it. But then after that, we'd have to do an investigation. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. If there's a workplace, you need to have a workplace investigation. And part of the process was you'd have to look and you'd see what happened. And, you know, let's just say uh, in, in this accident, um, somebody slipped and fell. So you'd say, what's the cause of the accident? Well, the cause of the accident is that someone was walking along and uh, it slipped and it fell. So why, what was the accident? They slipped and they fell. Or someone might have picked up a heavy box and, and they've injured themselves. So what's the cause of the accident? Oh, they picked up something heavy. But then our job was to look at what's the root cause why did it really happen? And then you say, well, you know, when you look at the root cause, the place was always filthy. There was no housekeeping. So it was an accident waiting to happen. So, so what's the root cause? The root cause is everybody leaves rubbish everywhere. So of course someone walks through. It's only a matter of time before somebody slips and falls. You know, uh, someone picks up a heavy box. Why did they do it? They picked up a heavy box. But then you look, well, where's the training to say not to pick up a heavy box? Where's the, where's the process in place that if it's a heavy box, you've got to assess, you've got to make sure you don't try and do it too heavy, so you look after. See, sometimes we look at a problem, but we don't look at the root cause of the problem. We look at the action of what happens. What, what, we look at, oh, what's caused it? Oh, it was a heavy box. I hurt my back. Oh, I, I slipped and I fell. Anybody can slip and fall. And that's true, anybody can slip and fall. But if you've got paper and rubbish and slippery stuff everywhere, your chances of falling are much higher. So what's the root cause? And so when we behave with our actions, when we interact with people around us, when we, when we do what we do, there are some reasons why we do some. Sometimes we act because we feel we're obligated. Sometimes we do what we do because we feel obligated to do things. You want to be a good mum. You want to be a good dad. You want to be a good friend. You want to be a good worker. And you want to make sure you feel obligated to obey God. You feel obligated to do things. And that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. But sometimes we feel obligated. This is what a Christian should do. This is the way that we should act. Sometimes we do it because we genuinely want to. We really want to do that. You know, we want, to, we, we, we want to be disciplined. We want a great outcome. We, we might really want to bless somebody. We might want to do something. Other times, why do we do things? Because we want to be accepted. Because this is, that's what we do. And, and many of us do this. We want to be liked by people. We want to make sure that what we do is nice. I love with the young people and certainly a lot of old people, they take pictures of themselves to put on uh, Facebook or uh, Snap or something like that. You know, if it's a bodgy brother like me, it's Snap it, whatever you got, you got, it's on there. Other people, it's like, hang on, the right angle, the right sun, the right smile, the right this, the right that. And they make sure everything's perfect. Why do we do that? Because we want to make sure that we look as, you ever seen like, I'm not having a go at the girls, but like wedding pictures for the girls, there's like 80,000 pictures and this is the one, this is the right angle, this is the right lighting, this is the right whatever. Why? Because we want to be liked. We want to, we want, we got a message to say, we want to be liked. And all of those are sort of external, they're secondary type reasons. But why do we do what we do? And they've sort of nailed in this study that the reason that we do what we, the reason that we do what we do is because of what we think of ourselves. The reason you do what you do is because of what you think of you, is because of how you see yourself. 
If you look in the Bibles, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 7, it says this, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. So the Bible says, how you think in your heart is how you act and react. If you see yourself as a tough guy in a situation, no one's going to push me around. Well, that's how you're going to act. If you see yourself as the generous sort of person, well, that's how you're going to act. If you see yourself as the peacemaker, that's how you're going to act. Because that's who you are. That's who you see. You see. But what they also say is that the way we act, the way that we act, that, that says that subconsciously, when you, when you are in any circumstance or situation, automatically, without even thinking about it, you kind of ask yourself these three questions. And they might be slightly different questions, but it really comes down to this. When you're in a given circumstance, when you're in a given situation, subconsciously, you automatically process a few things. Number one, you ask yourself, right, without even thinking about it, you think, what type of person am I? How do I, you know, without being politically correct, how do I identify myself? You know, am I a happy person? Am I a sad person? Am I a Christian? You know, am I a big person? Am I a little person? Am I a fit person? Am I a wealthy person? But what, how do you see yourself? Because what you do, you do what you do because of what you think of you. So what sort of person, what type of person are you? How do you see yourself? Secondly, is you assess straight away, what kind of situation is this? What situation is it that I'm following? I'm going to give a few examples, but still the three questions. What kind of, what type of person am I? What kind of situation is this? And the last one is this. What does a person, or what does someone like me, do in a situation like this? So usually... Usually, in, in most scenarios, without even thinking about it, without even assessing sort of stuff, you automatically do this, where you straight away will go, what type of person am I? What, am I an honest person? Am I a dishonest person? What sort of person am I? Do I love Jesus? Do I not really love Jesus? What sort of person am I? Then you think, what kind of situation is this? What is this? What sort of situation is this? And then how does somebody like me act in a situation like this? So we'll go back to the alarm. The alarm goes off. You hit the snooze button seven times. Are you the type of person that intentionally sets their arm early just so that you can hit snooze, just so that you want a bit of a, a sleep in? You know, you change the alarm messages, you spice it up, you do all sorts of things. Or you as the type of person that just gets up straight away. You want to be the first person at the meetings. When there's a meeting at work, are you the first person at the meeting? Are you the first person that gets there? Are you, or, or are you the person that sort of says, well, they can start, it's always rubbish at the first bit anyway, it really means nothing. I'll come when it's the serious bits. You know, what sort of person do you, how do you, how do you process sort of that? How do you process that information? You might be driving. In a car, most people drive. You're driving in a car. Somebody, as you're driving, cuts you off. Some of you are like President Putin in Russian. Your job is not to judge. Your job is to send them to God so God can judge them. Right? So you get, so it's your job to get angry. Who is this idiot? Who gave them a license anyway? How dare they? What are they doing? How, well, who gave them the license? What sort of person is this? And you get all angry and upset because someone's cut you off or someone's done something. And straight away you sort of get, ah, you're ready to bash them up. You know, they nearly caused me an accident. What sort of a person are you? See, it depends how you see yourself. Other people might be driving, someone doesn't say, oh man, this guy must be in a hurry. I, I did the same mistake yesterday. Maybe he's taking his wife to the hospital. Maybe he's sick. Maybe he can't drive properly. Whatever. <laughs> but, what, but what sort of person are you? And what does a person like you do in that situation? Do you lose your cool? Do you get angry? Because, you know, we're called to reflect the image of God. And, 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 and it's time and time again. You know, do we give grace? You visit a restaurant. You're eating together. What sort of person are you? Are you sitting there looking at the choice and saying, oh, man, we're all going to divide this bill by 10, so I might as well hoe in and eat a lot so I'll get my money's worth, right? Or do you think, you know, while everyone's there, you just sort of quietly, quietly go and you pay the bill because you want to 
be generous and you want to bless some people. Or do you do the classic youth group group, like while you're eating, everyone nicks off and then the last one standing pays for everybody. Right? <laughs> Happened to me more than once, let me tell you. <laughs> but what sort of a person are you? What sort of integrity do we hold as Christians? And more importantly, why do we do, why do we do what we do? And, I, and look, there's a thousand reasons, there's a thousand scenarios that I could put you through. In every part of your life, I would put to you that you do what you do ultimately because of what you think of you, because of how you see yourself. You go to the shops, and this is what happened to most people, you go to the shops and the, you've got to pay 50 bucks. They make a mistake, you give them a $50 bill, they give you $10 back, change. It's clearly a mistake. What sort of a person are you? Do you get on your hands and knees and say, thank you, Jesus, I was praying for some money, and Lord, you gave it to me. And you thank Jesus for money, and you keep it, and you don't say anything, say, oh, they ripped me off anyway. Or are you an honest person? You say, no, excuse me, I'm sorry, you've made a mistake here. It was $50, I gave you 50 I don't have to get any change. What sort of a person are you? When it comes to tax time, what sort of a person are you? When it comes to any time, what sort of a person are you? Where we can sort of, where, because the truth is, you do what you do because of what you think of you. So how do we get there? How, 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 what's the next point? If you want to change, and how do I change what I do? Because if I was to speak to each and every one of you, each and every one of you would say, Robert, I've got a lot of really, really good habits and disciplines, but it wouldn't take long to speak to people and they would say, oh, Robert, there's so much of my life that I want to change. There's so many things that I do and I want to change. And one of the lies of the devil is that you can't change. And one of the lies of the devil is that you can't come closer to the image of Jesus. And it will keep you enslaved because you think that you can't change. And the same as last week, as I said, to change is not behavior modification. Because you try and change by yourself, you'll never do it. You need a spiritual transformation. But to get a spiritual transformation happening, you really need to be connecting with God. It really needs to be the Holy Spirit's work. And part of that is seeing where God, remember last week we said, some people think they've got to do everything, right? Some people think God has to do everything. But the truth is we need to work together with the Lord to see change. And so we need to work together with the Lord to see change happening in our lives. And if you want to change what you do, the truth is you need to change what you think of you. That's like the foundation thing. You need to change what you think of you because it's often easier, easier for us to believe the negative about ourselves than the positive. It's always easier to believe the bad stuff than the good stuff. And the, and, and the truth is that the devil is a liar. We look in the book of John chapter 8 verse 44, right? And it says this, the devil has always hated the truth, right? The devil hates the truth, right? Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth, when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. So when God says to us, when God says to you and he says to me that we can change, you no, Brother Robert, I, maybe you, not me. I can't change. But you can change. We can all change. Because God wants us to change. Why? Because he wants us to reflect the image of God. Is this helping you guys this morning? It can help you because God wants us to change. So we listen to the lies for so long that... That, that, that we listen to the lies for so long that we, we start to believe it. And sometimes it can be on a big scale. Sometimes it can be on a little scale. You know, like myself. You know, a, a while ago when it was like holiday time, I kind of really wanted to take my family on a little holiday. I thought, oh, I want to really bless them. And as usual, I start mucking around and going on the internet. And before you know it, I looked at all this stuff and, you know, Pierre and I were looking and, man, there was like, whatever it was, cruises, it's got to be like, and when I looked, oh, this would be great. Everyone would love this. And then I saw the price of how much it was going to be if I wanted to do that. And I thought, this is crazy. I can't spend that much. And so I made the right decision. Sorry, kids, we didn't do that particular thing. And we didn't do it. But for a while, I felt, 
I was really down on myself. I thought, I mean, I feel so bad. I thought, I'm a dad. I want to bless my kids. I want to really, I want to do something really good. I want to, they would love it so much. It would be so much fun. But look, you can't do it. Look at you. Well, why would you do that? Look at this. And then if before you know, so, oh, you're not much of a dad. And if you, sometimes your thoughts can be like on, on train, railroad tracks. Do you know what I'm saying? Where if you start to get a negative thought, I'm pretty good because I sort of don't have much thought process. That's one of my positives. So I sort of get off pretty quick. But if you stay on the track, if you stay thinking like that, it's pretty easy to start thinking negative about yourself. And it is always easier to think bad about yourself than thinking good about yourself. Because you've got the, always the negative thoughts coming into you, talking about, oh, you could have done, you should have done, if you'd have done this, if you're a good dad, if you're a good this, if you're a good husband, if you're a good wife, if you're good this, you should do this. If you're a good Christian, this is what you'd be doing. And before you know it, you, you, you feel like, oh, man, I wish, I, I wish it was different. But you've got to take your head off those tracks because those tracks will lead you nowhere. Why? Because they're all lies from the pit of hell. They're all lies that will end you up nowhere. And, 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 and so you've got to be really careful. Because you get an identity that is not reflective of what God thinks about you. Your identity becomes what the enemy thinks of you or what the world thinks of you. And your distorted identity starts to sabotage your capacity to change and your distorted identity of how you see yourself begins to distort how you can do things for God and how you can live a better life. That's why we need to understand, have an understanding of the scripture and, 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 and do what God does because we forget our position. You forget who you are in Christ. You forget all the good that you do. You forget all the great things that you do for God. You forget, that you forget your perspective. And, like, and then so what happens is you begin to sabotage yourself. You become a self-fulfilling prophecy when you start talking bad about yourself. It becomes, oh, I'm a really bad guy. You start thinking that rubbish. You start acting like that. The more you negative you, that's why I hate negative talk. Like, I hate it. You ask my family, if one, you want to get me angry, if I hear the negative talk, I just, you know, that, then other bad habits come because I want to smash someone. If I hear the negatives, I hate the negative talk. I just hate it. Why? Because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you talk negative. When you talk bad about yourself, a circumstance or situation, it is a self-fulfilling prophecy because as you begin to speak, that's what you are. That's why you, when you speak about yourself or others, you've got to reflect the image of God. You've got to love God. You've got to see yourself how God sees you. You know God loves you. You know he absolutely loves you. Some of you are parents and you, when you look at little kids, like when I hold my grandkids and stuff like that, I don't see the bad in them, I see the good in them. Are they cheeky? Oh, mate, they're cheeky. My blood runs in their veins. Of course they're cheeky, right? right? They're cheeky, but don't worry, yours are cheeky too, right? Because we're sinners, right? We're all bad. But guess what? We're all fantastic. Why? Because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Because God can do anything through you if you allow him. And you listen to all the negative stuff and you're going to act negative. You listen to all the rubbish and you're going to be, you're going to be like rubbish. Your distorted identity creates destructive habits. That's kind of where I want to get to. You become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Your destructive habits, your, uh, where is it there? There you go. Your distorted identity creates destructive habits. That's the truth. Why? Because of who you see yourself. So this is how a person like me acts. And your destructive habits reinforce your distorted identity. That's why you're a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's why parents should never talk to their kids and say to them, you know, bad, bad, bad stuff all the time. You talk bad, that's how they're going to end up. Speak life into them. You know, a Christ-centered identity leads to Christ-honoring habits. Christ honoring habits reinforce a Christ centered identity. So the thing is that we choose who we are and we choose what we want to do. Because how do we do it? We break destructive cycle. How? By changing, firstly, the way that we think about ourselves. And it's not positive thinking, it's biblical thinking. It's daring to believe what the Bible says. 
right? Because God won't come down and, 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 you know, I'll tell you this, we won't have an altar call that says, who wants to change? Oh, I want to change. We run down, we pray, but if you're not going to do anything about it, God's not going to do anything. So it can't be all you and it can't be all God because it just doesn't work. God works through you, abundantly through you. He loves you. But to do that, you've got to change. We really, we really have to begin to change the way that we think about who we are. It's not important who the devil says you are. It's not important who others say you are. It's not even important who you think you are or what you think about yourself. What's really as important is what Jesus says about you. Can I hear an amen? What's important is what Jesus says about you. And part of that is doing godly habits. This is the boring stuff. Because we've got to work with God. I'll, I'll give you a Spanish quote. Sorry, it's not Latino, it's Spanish. This is a Spanish proverb. All of my Latino friends can wave and say praise the Lord. And they say this. It's a Spanish proverb. It says this. Habits are first cobwebs, then cables. Habits are first cobwebs, like a spider cobweb. You ever seen a spider cobweb? They're very weak to go through, but they become cables when you consistently do, when you consistently reinforce them, do it. Here's another one. Uh, here's another quote by a guy called Sidney Harris. He says this, it is, a common, it is commonplace how easily a child of three or four picks up a foreign language if exposed to it without any formal teaching. Are you guys aware of that? You ever seen little kids, they go to another country? My dad tells me when I was four years old, I was always speaking English. I went to Italy. He said after a few months, I could only speak Italian because little kids pick it up really quick. Right? Little kids pick up stuff. And, so, and many people acknowledge that. They, you know, all the child psychologists and all the teachers will say the first few years of your life, they absorb everything and they learn and it's very quick for them to learn language and stuff like that. He goes on to say this, it's commonplace how easily a child of three or four picks up a foreign language if exposed to it without any formal teaching. Yet we are unwilling to admit that a child of the same age picks up our unconscious attitudes and prejudices, prejudices without being taught. And often these are longer than any of his formal education. That's kind of why as parents, we kind of really got to be careful with our children. Because they absorb things like a, like a sponge. And, and we're called on to reflect the image of God. So what sort of, holy ha what sort of habits, I was going to say holy habits, but what sort of habits can you do to change? Because first thing you've got to see, how do you see yourself? And, and like you could do to hundreds of them, but, but let's think about Jesus. Jesus in Luke chapter 21 verse 37 says this, each day Jesus was teaching at the temple, but then each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called Mount of Olives. So you got the picture, Jesus would go out and he would be teaching in the temple and he would be teaching in the temple, but time and time again, all through scripture you would see that as he was teaching in the temple, then Jesus would go and Jesus would be, um, he would go to the Mount of Olives. And what do you think he was doing there? He wasn't chillaxing. He wasn't watching Netflix or he wasn't taking things easy. He knew the secret of his power. And although he was the son of God, he was the king of kings, he would go there and he would pray. He would spend time with his father. It was a habit that he would do. And if you want to change your life, we need to have, we need to spend time with our father. We need to get habits in us that bring life and not death because you'll default to who you do why is it some people they don't want to but straight away as soon as they're alone and the door shut straight away they'll go and they'll watch pornography and deep down they don't really want to do it they don't think that they want to do it but they just default there without even thinking about it why because of the way that they see themselves why is it some people get into an argument straight away they, they get all this negative stuff why is it that they fight? Why? Because of the way that they see themselves. But you need to, I need to, we need to develop habits that are godly, 
Because it's in those habits, when we create those disciplines, that things begin to change. And Jesus did that. Jesus would preach by day, but then at night time, he knew where to get the he knew where to get the fuel. He knew where to get to the change. Because you can't give what you ain't got. Can I hear you say Amen? And and preaching is good. Coming once a week on a Sunday is really good. But this is sort of like the game plan and a bit of a teaching. But then you go out and you really play the game. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So what's the practical application? What's the practical application of this? How do you change? And you start with you start with who you are. You start with the who before you do. I've written down here. Instead of focusing on what you want to do, decide on who you want to become. Decide on who you want to become. Decide on what sort of a person you are. What sort of a person I am in this situation? What sort of a person I am am I in that situation? I am a parent who is fully present. And I will be wholly intentional. I won't be on my phone all the time looking at stuff. I'm a teenager who has found purity in Christ. And I will not look at porn. I'm a man of God who will lay down his life. And I will serve my wife. And I will serve my children. And I won't think of myself. I will serve others. I will make sure they're okay before I'm okay. That's what a man does. I am someone who is sober and is a testimony to the power of Christ to change. And you might even have to get a little bit specific. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is uh, Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 7.22. Little by little will change the land. It's not going to happen in one hit. I am a person who doesn't skip workouts if you want to get fit. I'm a Christian who reads my Bible every day. I won't look at anything else until I read my Bible. And, 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 and so when you say, I'm going to read my Bible, it doesn't mean you're going to be there three hours. Start with something. I am a person who puts God first in my financial decisions so that I can honor Him. I am a discipline. I am disciplined. Jesus in me is stronger than the wrong desires in me. A guy called James Clear said this. He said this, every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. That's pretty profound when you think about it. Every other, it is up there. Every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. It's not what you talk that's important. It's what you walk that's important. People are sick of church. I'm sick of church in the sense that people that say they do stuff and they're not going to do it. you got to walk the talk. i got to walk the talk. The rubber's got to hit the road in a good way. But little by little. doesn't mean you've got to change. It's, I'm talking about the thought process of what we're doing. No single instance will transform your beliefs. So this doesn't happen overnight. right? But as the votes build up, so does the evidence of your new identity. So it's little by little. No one would go to the gym day one and expect to lose weight. You'd give yourself time, six months, three months, six months, a year. Or you're like me, every time you go to gym, you put a, you, you stand on the weight and you go off. Yeah, I, I ate a little bit less. Oh man, I lost one gram or something like that. It doesn't work like that really. It, it, you shouldn't do that. The devil tells you that you're a loser. And I'm gonna, this is my last verse. And he says this. In Ephesians chapter 4, 21 to 24, it says these words. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. No single action will ever change your identity, but multiple actions will change you. Remember, not behavior modification, spiritual transformation. So I'm going to close, but my question is, who are you? How do you see yourself? Could I have every head bowed and every eye closed just this morning? And I want to ask you some personal questions. You don't have to put up your hand. You don't have to respond. But this is just you and the Lord. Just you and the Lord. The Bible says that you're a new creation 
in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that you're God's workmanship, created in the image of Christ. The Bible says that you're the light of the world. If you're a Christian, you're the light of the world. You're an ambassador of God. That's the highest ranking diplomat sent by God to this world. You're not who the devil says you are. You're not what other people say of you. You're not what even you think of you. You're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You're a child of the living God. That's the truth and the devil's a liar. And I want to encourage you to believe what God's word says of you today in Jesus' name. And I do want to pray for you while you're seated there. And as I'm praying, I'm going to pray that the Lord would reveal to you just little steps for you to help you with your change. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for the most wonderful, beautiful, gracious group of people, Lord, that it's been my honor to know, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for each and every single one of these beautiful people. Lord, we know that we sit here, Lord, with all of our faults, Lord, and all the um, negative stuff, Lord, that we're prone to doing. But Father, we thank you, Lord, that you love us with an indescribable love, that you're for us and you're not against us, that you want the very best for us. Lord, I pray for every man, woman, and child in this place today in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, for the blessing of God to fall upon them. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as we desire, Lord, to make decisions, Lord, if we desire to put in godly habits, that you would speak into our lives, Lord. And, Lord, those things, Lord, that, that those little things that are almost like self-fulfilling uh, prophecies that bring us back, Lord, we wouldn't listen to the lies, Lord, but that we would purpose within our heart to do good. Lord, we say that we love you, Lord. We say that we need you. And we say that we thank you for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy. In Jesus' wonderful name. And all God's people said, Amen. Love you people. God bless you.